Hey, hey, party people. Welcome to this month's video. Today, I have a highly requested and anticipated video. This is my interview with fashion designer, Melissa. Melissa, please pronounce your last name for us since I, I, I don't want to butcher it. No problem. Uh, my last name is Calamia. Calamia. Okay. So, Melissa, please introduce yourself to everyone. Tell us about yourself, what you do, and why you do it. Okay. Um, so, I'm a senior designer. I've been specializing in intimate swim, active, and lounge for about eight years now. Um, the reason that I like this specialization is for the same reason that a lot of people hate it, which is the fact that it's really technical, um, it's incredibly subjective, and it almost never gets the credit that it deserves. Uh, it's usually not the star of your show in terms of a fashion collection unless your brand that specializes in it. So um, because of this problem, the market is saturated with a lot of really bad product, and we've kind of just come to accept that as the normal. So... For women especially, shopping for a new bra or a swimsuit is such an anxiety-inducing experience that a lot of people would rather skip the pool party than go to a department store and look at their bodies in an ill-fitting swimsuit under poor lighting, which is totally understandable. Um, but it's come to lead a lot of people to believe that their bodies are the problem instead of understanding that the product is the problem. So I like lending my specialization to these with primarily functional garments so that I can help to alleviate some of that anxiety in such a vulnerable moment for people who are looking for this type of intimate product. So just knowing that I can create things that can give someone the confidence to hit the pool or the gym or just the comfort to feel their best in day-to-day -day life is really fulfilling. Wow. <laughs> it's true. Like the kinds of garments that you design, that you create, they're, they're tough for women. Like, it, it's a hard buy. They're not like T-shirts. Honestly, I get a lot of people trying to start a new T-shirt brand. I'm like, yeah, because that's easy. So all of these questions are questions that I received across my social media uh, from all of my subscribers and followers, etc. So what is it that you do at work? Uh, what's an average day like? And what specific things do you do at work? Okay. Um, so an average day is kind of difficult to pinpoint in fashion because fashion works on a calendar, as I'm sure most of you already know. So it depends on which stage of the calendar you're in. So in early stages of a seasonal calendar, we're working on my concept creation. So, uh, during that time, my day could be filled with things like market research, watching the latest shows, checking out stores, just to analyze what's trending, what's missing in the market and how it can all relate back to our design direction. I also spend a lot of time in museums, researching artists, and just generally trying to find inspiration to incorporate into a seasonal concept. Um, but in stark contrast, if you're talking about something like our technical development stage, which is post-concept, we've started designing the products, and now we have to tell our factories how to make our first photos and samples. Um, we will spend days pouring over tech packs, which is essentially data entry. <laughs> no designer's favorite task, for sure, but... It's so vital because you have to explain every single detail about how you want this product made from the color and construction down to like stitching and materials of every single piece of every single garment. So very wide variety of day-to-day <laughs> -day activities. Um, but like overarching or like specific responsibilities, I'm responsible for uh, developing seasonal color and concept under the direction of my leadership and then interpret that concept into tangible product help source the materials to make that product and communicate with manufacturers on how to construct that product. Uh, I also lead fittings, present final collections. Uh, I do a lot of travel to trade shows and to meet with manufacturers. And during this entire process, I'm usually asking myself a ton of strategical questions like, is this right for the brand? Does it tie into the greater strategy? Um, does it support the story to lead us to our next product? And my most frequent question to myself is how on earth am I going to communicate my thought process and research to leadership in a way that's digestible to them and ultimately to our customers. So that communication, what, you know, when you say, how do I make this digestible to them? What's the most difficult part like that they have a problem receiving? I think it's just the volume of information. So if you're designing a whole collection, your first instinct would just be to go like piece by piece and describe every single little thing, but you're going to put everyone to sleep and they will retain 
pretty much nothing from what you're trying to explain to them. So it was trying to like gather like the common themes and speak to like more general terms. Like these are the prints that we're going after. These are the fabrics that we're going after. These are the trims that we want to use. Um, and just trying to shorten the explanation as much as possible and keep people engaged. Okay. Uh, at work, what are the things that you collaborate with on with others and what are the things that are your sole responsibility? Um, that is a good question. So of pretty much everything that I just described, there's not one component that isn't collaborative in some regard. Um, a great designer is only as good as the team supporting them and the support that they give to their team. Um, I am lucky to have a super skilled and competent cross-functional team, and they do things for me like communicating fit comments, finding fabric mills and manufacturers, um, just different partners that are consistent with our values and growth strategy, um, my merchants who translate the budget into a strategy and seasonal roadmap, um, and then I also have an amazing associate designer working under me to help me execute all of the above tasks. Uh, there's almost nothing that I do that can be traced back to just me. So how many people are in your team, would you say? Um, currently, like in my team, it's directly report to me. I have one. I have an associate designer. But then lateral people on my team, in my called the cross-functional team, I have two merchants, two TDs, um, three people on production sourcing, um, Trying to think of who else. I also have my manager. I don't want to leave anybody out of this. <laughs> this isn't your Oscar speech, Melissa. <laughs> no one's yeah. going no to get offended. Write it in People magazine. Melissa forgot to mention her mom in her Oscar speech. I think out of like all the people that you mentioned, that the I think that the one that people will be least familiar with is merchants uh, as part of your team. Can you describe a little bit about what they do in relation to your job. Yeah, of course. Um, so merchandising, they're literally responsible for like the visual merchandising of how the product is going to look, what the assortment is going to look like. So they're a little bit more analytical counterpart to design. So they take things like the budget, um, historical sales data, and they kind of calculate that all out into like what we need to buy in order to meet our goals. So they will pass me off a roadmap that says things like, we want to carry over four colors from last season and we want to add maybe like six new colors, two of which are fashion and the remaining, which you know we're kind of open to see what you have. And we want these silhouettes. Um, here's some trends that we think would be really relevant. And then those are the parameters basically that they set for design. And then once design gets some sketches and some like working product together, then they sit down and do a little pre-assortment. Then we get protos back and then they do final assortment. So they pick like actually every single SKU that's going on the website and what we're moving forward with. Just as a side, I have a friend who is a tech designer and she's like, <sighs> merchandisers just come into my fittings and they say, this isn't going to sell and that's not going to sell. And that didn't sell before. Um, I don't have too much experience with that <laughs> yet with my current merch team. And to be honest, I haven't had a ton of that in the past either. I mean, I think it's always a difficult balance with your cross-functional team to, you know, manage who is kind of staying in their lane, but also like very much respecting their opinions and understanding where they're coming from. And if they have things that I disagree with, then, you know, we can sidebar and talk about it and kind of negotiate a little bit, but they're all, you know, we're all looking out for the best interest of the company at the end of the day. So sometimes if it's, you know, I have to take a step back and kind of look at the bigger picture and maybe we don't need all of those greens and maybe they're right. Maybe this is the best time to test it and um, play it a little bit safer or more aggressively. It's just all about how you're communicating. You're like way nicer and more diplomatic <laughs> than my friend was me. I mean, but no, I've, I've had, I've had bosses and managers and merchants be like a lot more tactful when they say things for sure. She just happens to have one that's not particularly tactful at all. And she'll, you know, and she's new and she works for a giant corporate brand and she's like, no, yeah, that didn't sell last time. Mm, don't put that seam there. Yeah. So I guess it, it kind of matters on like, 
the brand and how much creative leeway a designer has, whereas like some companies really focus on the most wearable version of a thing. And I think that that's kind of the company that she works for as well. Yeah, it definitely depends on whether or not a company is more like merchant driven or design driven. Um, I think there's a bit of an equal split of both where I'm at right now, but that's yeah, nice. it, it would be very difficult to have a difficult merch partner because you really do work kind of side by side with them for so much of the process. They're one of like your biggest collaborative counterpoints across the cross-functional team. So definitely glad that <laughs> <laughs> I'm not having the same experience. <sighs> okay. So to rewind a little, uh, at what point in your life did you know you wanted to be a fashion designer? And at what point did you decide lingerie was what you wanted to focus on? I got that a lot. A lot of people want to know, like, all your early day stuff, when (laughs) you were like, ah, yes, this is what I want to do with my life. I think some people are a little bit lost, and fashion is a huge industry and you could be kind of like anywhere in it in terms of like job and like um you know garment category sorry I get teary when I laugh a lot (laughs) (laughs) well I'm not like weeping of (laughs) sadness but yeah so people really want to know like when did you want to when did you know fashion was your thing lingerie was your jam like my creative interests have always been somewhat clothing related. Um, my mom taught me how to use the sewing machine when I was pretty young. I honestly can't remember ever like looking at a sewing machine and not knowing how to use it. Um, so I would make doll clothes. I would make my own clothes. I would uh, thrift clothes and remake them. I would make all of my friends have skinny jeans when we were in our emo scene kid days. <laughs> and uh, started altering things and manipulating things. So I knew that it was something that I was really interested in. Um, My grandma also taught me how to knit, crochet, and embroider. So it was just always part of of my passion. And uh, my godmother was also a lingerie designer in Italy and Argentina and then had her own dressmaking shop when she moved to the U.S. So it surprised absolutely nobody that I wanted to. (laughs) And I think it surprised them even less when I told them that I wanted to be an intimate designer. Um, it, it sounds like it was fairly straightforward though, but I will say it was, it was a big decision. I mean, I actually dropped out of high school to enroll in school for, uh, fashion. Uh, it was difficult to get my family to support that choice to say the least, but I had a lot of conviction for a 17 year old. And I think eventually they recognized that, but my, I guess, interest in intimates started a lot when I was in college. I became obsessed with the counterculture designers like Vivian Westwood and Jean-Paul Gaultier and was at the same time equally obsessed with garments that had a high level of technical challenge like corsetry and underwires. Um, I also love the empowerment that lingerie gives to its wearers. So once I kind of found that there were some links between like Westwood to Agent Provocateur and Jean-Paul Gaultier for La Perla, um, I found my calling for sure and I just threw everything I had at it. All right. So, I mean, I've known you for a long time, so I know the answers to these things, but (laughs) did you go to school? Where did you go, if you want to share that? And what were the biggest benefits of your education? Because I would say that if I were to rank the popularity of questions that I get on my channel, like, uh, am I too old to get started? Do I need to go to fashion school? You know, what would I learn if I get there? You know, so did you think that school was a benefit to you? What were the biggest benefits? And what do you think that you learned in school that you use the most kind of in your everyday life? Okay. Well, I went to school at Academy of Art University in San Francisco, where I got my associates and my Bachelor of Fine Arts in Fashion Design. Uh, I think one of the biggest things that I learned there was just how to contain and focus my like frantic creativity into a more cohesive, adaptable, and well-rounded aesthetic. My professors pushed me so far outside of my comfort zone and really challenged me beyond what I thought I could have ever been capable of. And I don't think I would have learned my strengths and boundaries as early in my career as I did without that 
period of unbridled, supervised, constant experimentation. I would say most directly applicable skills would be pattern making and construction, for sure. Um, the science of fabric and fiber, big one. <laughs> um, color theory, constantly. Uh, time management and learning to handle criticism. One of my favorite things about this like weird fake internet career that I have is I have these uh, really interesting random conversations with strangers. And someone told me that they have turned uh, over at Parsons, they have made uh, pattern making and sewing optional courses for fashion designers. What do you think about that? That's a difficult one to wrap my head around. I don't understand how you could possibly design in these mediums without understanding how to work with them. That's like being a sculptor and never touching clay. Like I, I don't think I could ever work like that. I am very curious to learn from people who have taken that route, how that works for them. But yeah, that, that would make me uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Don't you think that, you know, just understanding how cutting works and how the body works and how something's going to drape, helps you be a better designer. Like you come up with more ideas because you're like, oh, I can do this with this fabric and I could do this. If I stitch it like this, it's going to look terrible because it's going to, you know, rip ripple real weird, you know, like you kind of have these like kind of like a backdrop of like knowledge as you're designing, no? Especially yeah, for something as technical as lingerie. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, a lot of my innovation and inspiration comes from creative pattern making and learning ways to, you know, try and eliminate a seam. And so sometimes I'm just draping with fabric or going back to pattern making and sewing up some mock-ups and just trying to figure out how we can do without or do better. But you have to understand the limitations of what you're doing because you can't just say like, oh, I'm going to eliminate an underwire and sew the bra the exact same way and it'll be so much more comfortable. It doesn't work like that. And you have to understand how a bra is made in the first place to know that that can't just translate like that. So I think it helps understand the limitations and if you can better understand the fit issues through knowledge of construction, then you can figure out how to innovate on them. Yeah, back to that whole everyone wants to make t-shirts because fit is so, you know, if you can get your head through the hole, <laughs> you can get your arms through, there's your t-shirt, who cares, you know, it's like the easiest thing to buy online, whereas lingerie online could be like, do you think you could do what you're doing now without school? Like, to have gotten as far in your career as you have in the time you've been out working in the world, could you be where you are without school, without your degree? Probably not, if I had to guess. I mean, I know that I had probably a stronger foundation than most people going into school, just with my background in sewing and understanding of construction. But I think like I said, just that, that supervised point of creativity, I think I would be a lot more limited in my confidence and ability to execute things. And I think I would be a lot less likely to, you know, be confident in my voice and bring my thoughts to the table because I was concerned that everybody already knew what I was trying to talk about and that it was already like something that couldn't be achieved or would be dismissed. Um, I think it would have, would have hindered my confidence a lot. It's so funny because, you know, I, I did an interview with two of my, my college classmates uh, a couple years ago, and I asked them, like, what's the number one thing you learned at school? And they're like, time management and the limits of my capabilities. Like, who knew I could produce that much work in that time frame, you know, under that much pressure? Like, I would never have imagined I could have done that. And then when you graduate and you know what you can do, you have like so much more confidence. You know, you can like, you know, you have so much more freedom because you know that you can do this much more than what you thought. And so I think that like a lot of what school brings you is a mental. I mean, of course, technical skills are there, but I think technical skills can be learned in a lot of different ways. But like, I think a lot of this like kind of mental stuff like having gone through that intense system. Yes. <laughs> I think I think a lot of people really feel that when they've come through like a 
a really competitive fashion design program like Otis, like Academy of Art, you know, like that. Um, yeah, I think also like there, I used to get more creative blocks and design blocks before I went to school and just didn't really know how to connect the dots or how to push through it. But when you're in school, it's kind of like beaten out of you. almost. <laughs> so constantly under pressure to be continuously creative that you can find inspiration in anything. You're just like, whatever that, okay, I'm doing it. It's my new project. It needs to be <laughs> finished in two days. So I really hope it works and go. And yeah. Cause designers, we don't have the luxury, you know, I read, you know, like you'll see things. A lot of people see these things where, you know, uh, the singer's album was pushed back. They had to re-record. They had to do this. It's like, designers for like commercial products like us, we don't have that luxury. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our deadline is this date. (laughs) That's the date. That's the date. it (laughs) It doesn't have to be so precious. You know, it's like you stop kind of putting like this ultimate inspiration on a pedestal and just start doing the work. And as it starts to evolve, you are really surprised by what things you can pull a lot of inspiration from and what things are actually influencing you. So in that regard, it was definitely worth the experience. I, you know, I did get a lot of people asking me what you were inspired by, but I think that kind of encapsulates it. It's like, it's the moment anything goes, you pick something, you run with it. It's not super precious. You got to do it anyway. The deadline is there. You're going to do it again. Sometimes I like the challenge of trying to find inspiration that's out of something that I'm not innately inspired by. Like not everything that comes down from leadership, like strikes me the same way that it strikes them, but I have to figure out how to make it strike me that way and how to interpret it. And so, yeah, it's, it's just one more, more challenge and one more thing that makes life interesting. So is that how that happens with you in your experience where leadership says this season, we're going in this direction and you just have to go with that? Um, It depends on where you work, but yes, that's a lot of how it goes. Um, You know, as I've gotten higher level positions and stuff, I'm more more and more responsible for helping to make those calls. But definitely at first, this is the inspiration and there you go and run with it. Here's the palette. um, Here's what we're doing. Now apply it to your category. I get this like, this is probably very spiteful and terrible of me. But I just get this deep sense of satisfaction when people working in the industry, like, back up things that I tell my students all the time. Because, like, (laughs) when I explain design process to people, you know, all these, like, newbie designers, they're like, Zoe, I don't do mood boards and I don't do color stories when I'm at work. I'm like, well, because you haven't been promoted yet. All the underlings, they're just given the direction and you have to design them. And then as you get promoted and as you, you, you can be more responsible for those decisions, you know, as you become a more senior level designer, director, moving on, you get more and more decisions put on your plate. But in the beginning, you're just doing flats. Like, here's your direction. Right? Yeah. A lot, lot of flats and tech cracks, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of color ups. Yeah. Um, learn to love Adobe Illustrator. You need to be able to use it in your sleep, like an extension of your arm. <laughs> <laughs> of an assistant designer 100 percent, and I mean it still is a lot of what I do too like you know I can't just delegate everything that I don't want to do all the time there's a lot of times where I have to you know sit down at my desk and pop open illustrator and like do the work right alongside my direct report and that's fine for me I mean I have been an individual contributor at companies in the past too where the entire thing was under my responsibility both to envision and to execute so I'm comfortable with it but yeah, you definitely get more doors open and more visibility into the overarching design process as you level up in your career. I'm going to ask a personal question. Nobody asked me this, but this is just coming from my own, uh, just for my own satisfaction. How much do you know about grading patterns? Enough to get me by. <laughs> do you, have you ever graded patterns before you yourself graded a pattern? I have never graded a pattern for an underwire bra before, but I have done some rough grading or set like grade rules for like a panty or a swimsuit and had someone else execute the grading. So you set grade rules, but someone else, you hire out the grading. 
uh, yeah, it either it usually goes through uh, tech design if you're a larger company, or whereas that before we used a company in the garment district. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Is that the answer you were hoping for? Because everyone and their mother asks me, can you do a grading video? And I'm like, I'm a designer. I don't know how to grade. I know mm -hmm. how to set the grade rule. Like, I want a large to be this size. I want an extra large to be that size. I don't know how to grade stuff. I've never graded. I graded a t-shirt just to learn what it is. Mm -hmm. And it was definitely just like a learning thing. That's it. I've only graded the one thing. And I'm like. It is like a beast in and of itself. It's certainly not for the faint of heart. And I feel like if you ever did a video about it, it would be a long and tedious one. So oh my God, it would get three <laughs> views, but no, seriously, like I just, I'm just, there's so many things to teach people in t about designing. I'm like, but we don't grade. Like just can you, let's just focus on the things you do need to learn. Like I'll do a hundred more illustrator videos before I do a single grading video, because you need to focus on the things you need to learn Agreed. Everybody wants to. I don't know why I get so many grading questions. I literally do not know why, but it's like a thing. I mean, it is a pretty like mysterious beast. There's not a lot of information about how to do it right, and there's also a lot of misinformation about what it is and what it means. And there's also a lot of companies that don't even do it right. I mean, there's so many occasions where you'll get things that are graded improperly between washes, and so one pair of jeans fits you at a certain size, and the other one, one the same silhouette by the same brand will fit you completely differently because the grading wasn't taken into account for the wash and the way that the fabric has changed through the dyeing process. So yeah, um, it's, it's very important, but yeah, I don't uh, do it too often. <laughs> I don't know any designers, you know, unless they are, have, have like a heavy tech background or they used to be tech designers, know much about grading at all. Speaking mm -hmm. of washing, Wash tests are another one of those things where none of my designers want to do it, but I'm like, do it anyway. And they never want to do it. It's like, oh, that's boring. I'm like, uh, a lot of designing is boring. There are a lot of things. Yeah. A lot of, it's not all just, you know, sitting in your ivory tower, doing beautiful illustrations all day long, but. You know, you know chain smoking and eating croissant. No, no. Yeah. All right. Next, <laughs> next question. <laughs> Actual questions people asked. Okay. Uh, I got a lot of questions about the beginnings of your career and your internship. So transitioning from school, because you went to school in San Francisco and now you're in New York. So can you outline your career a bit for us? Did you have any internships during school or after? Like how, and then why and how did you move to New York? Okay. This is a story, but let's dive in. <laughs> um, <laughs> so when I was at Academy of Art, um, my roommate and I wanted to get more real world experience into the fashion industry, but being in such a rigorous design program, we didn't have time to dedicate to like a corporate for credit internship or anything like that while we were trying to finish up our final collection. So we started a blog, which out of fear of completely aging myself. That was not a super popular thing to do at the time was to have a fashion blog. It was still a relatively unsaturated market. Um, so we started chronicling just what was happening in the local like San Francisco fashion scene or even like worldwide, just like reviewing fashion shows, reviewing local designers, new stores that opened up. And so once we started to get some viewership, uh, we were able to get press credentials to fashion shows and meet with other designers that were interested in having reviews. Um, we networked our asses off, and that was when I met you. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you were my first internship. Um, I was? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, no, I knew you interned for me, obviously, but I didn't know I was your first. Yeah, you were my first internship, um, which, as you know, started out kind of ad hoc, um, but then grew from there. And before I graduated, I was able to have – experience as editor-in-chief of a fashion blog and an internship with you listed on my resume before I even graduated. So I would just like to take this time to note that I, I think you did ask to be put on your references when you were looking for work in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to give it because she like showed up when so many people flaked. She like did what she was asked. 
And at the time, I didn't know much about like her design ability or her construction ability or anything. But it was like she showed up on time. She did what she was asked. And so much of it is like being there and doing what you're told and, you know, showing up and doing the work. So much of it is that. And so she left an impression on me without even like me getting into the nitty gritty of what she was doing. It's like, no, she has work ethic. She has professionalism. Yes, go hire her was kind of how my mindset at the time. Thank you. I appreciate that. (laughs) Um, So that led me to my next internship, um, which was my first internship out of school with a company called Zinke, who did swim, intimates, and lounge. Uh, The way that I found Zinke was just by reaching out and applying. Wanting to specialize makes it very difficult to use job boards like LinkedIn or Indeed or whatever. Um, so I would specifically target them, reach out to their like customer service and just ask if they were hiring any interns or if I could speak to anybody on the design team. Um, and I specifically targeted small companies because I wanted to kind of get my hands dirty and like the actual goings on of what you do as a designer and had heard from other classmates and friends who had had internships at larger companies that, you know, they were doing a lot of coffee runs and, uh, photocopies and sourcing and trips to the garment district. So I wanted to do something more than that. So I got what I asked for. It's for sure. Um, they offered me a paid internship with the promise of an assistant position at the end of the internship if I completed it successfully. So I took a risk and packed up everything, including my dog and moved up to New York. Dove in uh, head first into that job, and it was such a small company. I was employee number four of, I think, ultimately five. And because of that, and being the only other creative person, like the only other person on the design team besides like the creative director and co-founder of the company, I was handling absolutely everything and assisting with absolutely everything. So I would work on concept, uh, turn it into sketches, take those sketches and create the tech packs, do the flats, the color ups, show them back to my creative director, get her yes or no. Um, I would do first proto pattern making and sample sewing in the studio. And I would uh, even fit those, correct them. So it's then like second patterns to our domestic manufacturers. Um, did a lot of liaisoning with our domestic manufacturers. Uh, what else? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a lot like my first job too, because we were... There were six people in the office and we had two sample makers. So I didn't do any sewing or cutting, but yeah, I did a lot of designing stuff, but also production stuff. And then I was, they were very print driven company. And so I was designing prints as well. And then like going to production meetings and cause we did both international and domestic production. I love it. Like I always encourage people to like early on their career work at a small company. So you're wearing like a hundred hats And you're learning so many different parts of the business, which I think is like really key when you want to eventually start your own business. Not to say that you do, but like, especially for those business minded folks to like work at a tiny company, I think is so so valuable. Yeah, it really was. And I was, yeah, I was helping the operations manager with sourcing, even like production ordering, placing POs. It was so funny because I would meet with some of our suppliers for the first time and they'd be shocked that I was so young because they thought... (laughs) We're talking to someone higher up in the company. It's like, nope, just me, 23 years old. Can I have that fabric now? Thanks, bye. <laughs> I'm on a deadline. <laughs> Actually, on my lunch break right now. Please, I need to. Yeah, I also led two surfwear collaborations with three people while I was there, which was really exciting. Um, yeah, just so much more responsibility than I would have gotten at a larger company. And at the time, I didn't really know how much more I was doing until I wound up leaving and looking for a new job. So there were some outside factors that created a lot of tension in the company and the culture started to degrade really rapidly. Um, So I left and about a week later, the company unfortunately closed down. So I was afloat without a job as an assistant in New York City. Uh, I'd never left a job without having another one lined up before. I'd never really had a real job anyways. So uh, it was definitely against the advice of my parents to do it, but when they closed down anyways, I was like, haha, I made the right choice. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> so um, looking for a new job was really tough because I kept being rejected for being overqualified for other oh, assistants. Oh, so annoying. So I was kind of stuck, which is when I picked up freelancing. So 
uh, while I was freelancing, I found Shiloh Bird Studio, um, where I met Shiloh and Janae, who owned a product development studio up in Greenpoint, and they were helping major designers and some new up-and-comers get their product ready. So I worked for them as a swim intimates and activewear specialist. Uh, I was simultaneously working for the McCall Pattern Company, technical writing and illustrating. That is cool. basically to say that I wrote the instructions on all of those patterns that you open up with their little tissue thin paper, the little booklet that comes with it that shows you how to sew each seam and what piece goes next. And originally I just kind of took it as a way to make ends meet, get insurance, et cetera, while I was freelancing and just support myself during that time. Never, but I didn't know it came with a booklet because I've never yeah. used one of those before in my life. So they so they sell a booklet inside the thing which I knew of the tissue paper. Yes. Okay. So when you take out the tissue paper, there's also another page and there are a couple of pages folded up that tells you all of the steps in order to do things. So all the pattern pieces are numbered and then it illustrates the pattern like stitch the side seams together. Press. <laughs> Turn it inside out. Now I feel like I should like tell people to like start with that if they're like trying to teach themselves how to sew because the instructions are there so like if you learn how to make an apron with home pattern then you can figure out how to make an apron like a commercial version an industrial version whatever like okay. and it's not it's not directly applicable and sometimes it like hurt my soul to like follow the home sewing instructions because like the seam allowances are different than industry standard they're usually like a half inch where it's normally uh, for industry standard where it's normally like three quarters of an inch sometimes for home sewing. So that can be like, I would think a really hard habit to break if you start out doing home sewing. And then sometimes the construction is just ad hoc because they assume that you have a home sewing machine because you probably don't have an industrial machine uh, or a room full of industrial equipment to be able to sew all of these things that you need. So there's a lot of like using zigzags in places where you would have used, you know, maybe like a cover stitch or a marrow. Um, so they kind of fake out a lot of the construction. So it's, it's good and it's bad. Like it's good just to get you comfortable with a sewing machine, but you have to definitely take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Then never mind. But this was, <laughs> this was a very enlightening conversation though. <laughs> Glad to hear. See, you learn something new every day. Hmm. Okay. So you were Zinky, and then you were working freelance and also doing the McCall thing. And then? Doing the product development thing with Shiloh Bird was really great. And we worked for some awesome brands like Chromat, Flutamol, Cushney Docs, now just Cushney. Um, we also helped people launch new brands. So I did a ton of like client-facing work. Um, just really interfacing with the general public, which is something that you don't typically do a lot as a designer. Um, and just really like having to act as a leader and like person of authority. So I gained a ton of experience just on how to communicate with people. Um, I had my first like full-time direct report uh, and managed like a pool of rotating like seasonal interns, but I wanted to give like a broader, more long-term contribution to a company. Like there were so many times where I would be working on something and then and the contract is done and you give them their stuff back and then you have no idea if that made it into the collection until you like see it in a magazine or on the runway at one of their shows. And I just wanted to know more like end to end what was going to come of this product. And there were so many companies where I was like, oh man, like I wish I could actually just like dig deeper and like help you really fix your stuff because like I can identify all of these problems, but I just couldn't do anything about it. So um, I also, it was kind of, needing to get out of the feast or famine of freelancing. I couldn't like make it work enough for me to not have a second job and it was starting to burn me out. So that was when I went to work for Aeropostal, which is, as I'm sure a lot of you know, mass market juniors retailer, probably very familiar from those middle school years, the popped color polo shirts, double polo, perhaps, <laughs> depending. I don't think I ever um, partook in the double polo. <laughs> Um, Regardless of how other people feel about the brand and its legacy or whatever, how did, because I don't think that, I think for a lot of people, what the experience is working at a brand and the public's perception of the brand can be like completely different things. Yeah. Well, I felt like I had built enough groundwork working for smaller companies and working in freelance that I was finally ready to see what these large corporate design companies uh, looked like and worked like. So uh, I started there as their designer for Intimate Swim and then eventually took on Active while I was there as well. 
I definitely got to learn how the larger, larger corporate design companies work. Um, it was also my first time working for a merch driven company. So I learned a lot about just how to navigate corporate politics, to be honest, which is a really valuable skill. Um, and just learned how to work with like such a larger team and how to execute things without necessarily having a lot of visibility into like the whys and hows. Um, but eventually it just wound up not right being the right fit for me. Um, like I said, being such a big company, it's not really possible to give visibility to people who are at my level, but I've just never, ever worked like that before. And there was such a long chain of command. It just started to wear me down to try and constantly like push that boulder up the hill to get my ideas up to the top or to try and get a seat at the table. So I think it can work really well, like that kind of setting for people who like to focus just on the execution of design and just want to create that great product and want to leave the big overarching decisions to the people who are paid to make those decisions. But I like to focus on strategy. I like to have a seat at the table and I realized it would take a lot more levels for me to climb to be able to get there. So I wound up leaving. Yeah, it is just like a matter of what you like. And it doesn't have to be what other people think is the more glamorous thing, but just what works for you personality wise. Yeah, exactly. And like, that can definitely work very, very well for someone. I just was not the type of person to be in that environment for a very long time. So I was there for about a year and a half before I took my current job at Bombas to apply my passion for comfort and innovation to their product team as the senior product designer. Right. So how long have you been at Bombas? Uh, I've been at Bombas for a year now. I started last January, so just over a year. Bombas is a digitally native direct-to-consumer brand that creates comfort-focused apparel with a mission to help those in need, which is something that really resonates with me. They were founded because socks are the number one requested clothing item in homeless shelters, and for every item purchased, a specially designed item is donated to those in need. So the tees and socks that we sell to our customers are actually designed much differently than the socks and tees that we donate to the homeless community. And they're specially designed to be darker, to show less visible wear. They have more reinforcements to be a little bit more durable. Um, certain items have antibacterial treatments on them because they can't necessarily access laundry as often. So it's kind of cool to have like this duality and be able to design both customer facing products and products for those in need. Um, so far we've actually donated 30 million pairs of socks to the homeless community in the six years that the company's been in business with the help of 3000 giving partners nationwide. That's a lot. <laughs> that's wow. That's really impressive. And you know, the socks thing, it makes so much sense, but it's just one of those things that you don't think about. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people think about donating to food banks and toiletries, but socks, that's true. Socks are important. Yeah, you can't donate a used pair of socks. So. Yeah. And a lot of times even there has to be like proof that it's new, like it still has to be in the packaging. So even if you just tried them on, you still can't donate them. So uh, it was a huge need that we saw and that we wanted to meet. And so they've put their mission behind it and they really believe in everything that they do. I mean, I can tell you firsthand from working there that it's just such a, a great company to work for. Truly, they they mean what they do and they're so committed to their mission and to giving back. We have like 10 to 15 different opportunities throughout the year uh, or throughout every month, actually 10 to 15 opportunities per month that we can go and work with some of our giving partners in the community and do uh, either donations or we can cook for a shelter. There's a ton of different things that we get to participate in and it it kind of helps like with the culture too of like level setting the playing field because you know you may be handing out a pair of socks like next to someone you've never really worked with that much before or maybe you're next to the CEO and so it just gives everybody a bit of an opportunity to get to know each other better too and to really reinforce like that connection of giving back together. That's really nice. I've never worked for a company that works so hard to give back. That's that's really cool. That's really cool. Okay, so back to uh, subscriber questions. What advice would you give to aspiring designers on how to get those first internships and jobs? Just keep emailing. I mean, you have to like become a detective these days. You can't just submit your application into like the online form because it goes into a black hole of who mm -hmm. knows where most of the time. So, you know, 
you have to use LinkedIn to find who the hiring manager is, the recruiter, and send them an email directly or send both of them an email directly, just explaining your interest in the position and be authentic with uh, your emails. Don't copy and paste every time, especially if you're sending to the same company. They're going to compare notes. Don't do that. Um, also, making sure to explain what you bring to the table instead of why you want to work with them. Um, you can use recruiters, network, again, be persistent. I actually had an interview once where they didn't respond to my follow-up after the interview because they wanted to see if I would follow up again and how long it would take because email follow-ups are often such an integral part of being an assistant designer. So, you know, you never know when they're trying to test you, so follow up. Um, also follow up on rejections. Uh, see if they're hiring again a few months later or, you know, six months later. Just keep the lines of communication open. Um, I've actually gotten friends interviews at places I've never worked before because I was still in contact with their internal recruiters and saw a job opportunity that, that I thought they'd be a great fit for. Um, let's see what other tricks have I used. Also applying to roles above and below your title and asking if the title is flexible because a lot of times they may not be like discriminant against whether you're an assistant or associate. They just want somebody um, and maybe they posted it as an assistant and you were really looking for an associate or vice versa. Um, so I think there are certain realms of flexibility depending on the job title. So definitely look into that. Some um, people have like different ideas on, you know, what gets handled by who. And like, I think depending yeah. on the size of the company, like job titles get absorbed into one because there are mm -hmm. fewer people or something like that. Yeah, for sure. I'd also just encourage people to edit everything that they're sending, like, tailor your resume to who you're sending it to, tailor your portfolio to who you're showing it to. Um, I have had so many people just plop a dictionary full of work on my desk and like ask me to sort through it, but it's so reflective of how you work as a designer. And I don't want someone that's going to just plop a pile of sketches on my desk and ask me to pick the best ones. I want someone with conviction about what they like and what they think and what they want to show me. So I think that's really, really important and something that maybe doesn't get taught as much as it should when interviewing or even just when showing your portfolio. And also keep your portfolio up to date throughout your career. That is a rule that I don't always follow myself. And every time I don't do it, I really regret no, having to rebuild my portfolio. No designer, no designer does it until they start, want to start looking. They're like, I want out. Okay, portfolio. Then, like, sometimes it's like it's so insurmountable when you go to do it again that you just like delay looking for a job and you just stay at a job <laughs> you don't want to be at because you'd rather be there than work on your portfolio. <laughs> so, from your point of view, what are some thing? What are what are the things that people need to be putting in their portfolios, and what are some things about uh, portfolios that you hate? You know, that's not going to get work, or you're like. I want this person. I think, like I said, showing like an edited collection that actually relates back to the brand that you're trying to apply for um, shows a lot of ability to edit and just infer that it's not really about you. It's about the company. It's not just about showing like your breadth of work or your skill set, but just showing what you can do for them. Um, I also like to see portfolios where there's a range of different uh, like executions, like some digital drawings, some hand drawings, but also like maybe in one collection that was really technical, I want to see your flats and your tech racks. And maybe in the next one that's like really whimsical and creative, I want to see what your thought process was and what your mood boards looked like. And not doing all of those things for every single collection that you have, but just choosing which ones that make sense for to make your portfolio a little bit smaller. Um, I also really like digital portfolios for that purpose too, because if you're the kind of person that's like, but what if they want to see this one? What if I didn't bring like the one that would be super relevant? Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Um, that's then, every like, student. <laughs> that's every student. Cause they don't know what they're like. Oh, I don't know what the hiring manager wants. So I'm just going to take everything. Yes. And I hate when people take everything and most hiring managers hate when you bring everything. So I like digital portfolios for that reason, because if, something comes up and they want to see something like more bright, more sunny and be like, well, I have a swim collection that I can show you. And I didn't put it in this because I didn't think it was relevant, but if you want to see it and they're like, yeah. And then just like navigate to the folder that it's in on my iPad and pull it up and there you go. So. Yeah. Back in the days when I was paper. looking for design work, we didn't have digital portfolios. Like when I started college, like not everyone had an email address. So every <laughs> student had physical cubbies and teachers would slide you notes into your cubby to get a hold of you. 
because I'm oh old gosh. like that. So we didn't have the luxury of digital portfolios. So I would take everything, but I put in a giant piece of paper. So like I, I could reorganize my portfolio all the time. And I would put the three best that I thought would fit for this particular interview at the top, like the, the first pages. And then I stuck that big piece of paper in there. Like that's, that's what I wanted you to see. Like, this is how I edited. I think you would be interested in these. But if they were like, so do you? And I'm like, oh, in the back. Yes. And just kind of <laughs> shuffle in the back. But like, you don't have to look at those if you don't want to. So yeah, like for those paranoid people. But like, I think at least showing that you thought about that specific interview and you put together the projects that you thought worked best for that particular. And I, I'm asking you these questions because these are, my students' obsession. So when you email, when you cold email, mm. like what are the things that you mention in your cold call emails? Um, I usually mention the fact that I applied through whatever portal it was that they had. Um, but then I will reattach my resume and I usually have like a preview of my portfolio. So it'll be just a few like select images like put into a PDF that I think are really brand right. But I don't want to like give it all away either. So like my website, I have like just a ton of like final product shots. Um, it's kind of all dumped in there so that you can see like the range, but I don't have any of my sketches. I don't have a lot of my like flats or tech packs or anything in there. And then my portfolio is like fully fleshed out with, uh, you know, representation of all of the different things that I've done. Um, and then the PDF that I send will yeah usually just be a few like key images or even like work in progress images of certain things or like some collections that I've designed for myself that haven't been produced, just whatever makes the most sense uh, to put into there, but trying not to overlap too much on any of those three things between the preview of the website and the portfolio. Um, and then in the email, I usually just state that I've applied and reiterate my interest in the position and ask if they'll either forward my information onto the hiring manager or, you know, thank them for taking the time to read it and, always close with looking forward to hearing from you and send it off and cross my fingers. So it sounds pretty short and sweet. Yes. Yeah. Usually I say like the big long spiel for like a cover letter where you talk about your experience and how that would be relevant to the company and you know, where your shortcomings may be, but how you could make up for them. Like, and I don't call too much attention to your shortcomings, small things. Yeah. Small things are okay. <laughs> um, if you think they may like be the difference between getting an interview or not, it's okay to address them. But Definitely don't dig too Highlight deep. them. <laughs> I know um, my favorite is when someone sends me a portfolio and be like, okay, so I know I'm really bad at this. I'm like. Yeah. A lot of times if you don't point it out, they're not going to notice or maybe they will notice, but yeah, you don't want to be the first person to call attention to every flaw you've ever. Yeah. Had. Like you can have an explanation ready, but like, don't be like, look at this thing that is so bad. <laughs> like, yeah. But if like, say like you are a denim designer and you're applying for a swim position, like sure, you can be like, I may not have much experience in swim, but this is how my experience in denim is applicable. So like those kinds of things, cool to point out. Mm. Switching gears a tiny bit, uh, how do companies work with trends? Do you attend fashion forecasting presentations? And if so, how are those integrated into design and decision making in the whole design process? Um, so every company responds differently to trends. Some are going to be driven by trend and staying ahead of trend, while some are going to respond closer to real time. And then on the flip side, some are intentionally staying away from trends or being anti-trend. The through line through all of that is that as a designer, it's still your job to know the trends, whether you're incorporating them or avoiding them. Um, and they can be worked into the design process at pretty much any stage. Like to incorporate it, there's really no rule. So like say if yellow is trending, I should probably have an iteration of yellow on my palette. And if like a high cut leg for swim is trending, I'll consider adding a silhouette or two. But am I going to do a high leg yellow swimsuit? Maybe. It depends entirely on the brand. That's usually where merchants come into play to say, no, that's too trendy for us. We don't want to go there. Too big of a risk. We can do yellow, but we're doing it in a standard silhouette. And maybe we can do that high leg in something safer, like a black. Um, and yeah, it just depends on how invested your company is to staying on trend. Because I get a lot of students who tell me things like they don't like to look watch runway shows they don't like to know what's going on because they don't want to accidentally copy 
it, what would you say to someone like that where they don't want to know what's going on? It's a lot easier not to copy someone if you know what they're doing in the first place. <laughs> I mean, there's been like instances too with like schools uh, having like their collections come out and like at the same time, another like major designer has released something really similar. And now the student is like, you know, kind of in a bind for job prospects because it looks like they just knocked off like some major, major designer. And in those instances, when it's so like soon after and you can't react to it and you're a student and you've spent like $7,000 on fabrics and multiple nights um, <laughs> trying to sell your <laughs> That doesn't sound familiar. Really at the last minute, but um, the same can be true when you're actually designing for for a bigger brand. You don't want to come across as though you may be accidentally knocking off like an indie brand, for example. Like that's a huge, huge no-no as a major designer these days. Um, you don't want to be known to be like duplicative or copycatting anything. So even if you're just like gathering inspiration from images, like you should know where those clothings things you should know where that clothing comes from and what brands are making it so that you know who you're pulling inspiration from but I mean I don't get as much time as I would like to like stay current with the shows and nobody can watch all of them unless you like work for a trend forecasting company and that's your job to watch all of them but you should definitely need to stay in the loop and know the trends so that you can avoid those pitfalls of copying them or falling too deep into them or um professionally do you at the office or in previous companies, use those forecasting services, you know, as part of your process, or is it up to the designers to just keep abreast of trends as part of their job, like kind of separately? Um, both. I mean, I think any company, it's your job to keep abreast of trends for sure. Um, some brands that I've worked for rely super, super heavily on like WGSN and other trend forecasting services. And some of them, don't even have an account to log in and take a look. Um, it just depends on how much they want to know about what the upcoming trends are, how much they believe in them or how much they want to carve their own path. But yeah, okay. it really dependent on the company. So I wasn't going to ask this. It wasn't in my radar to ask, but I recently got my own onslaught of this question. Do you know how to sew? Yes, I definitely know how to sew. Um, you could like not have made it out of that school if you did not know how to sew. Yeah. I had, I know that for sure. Cause I'm, I'm friends with several former construction teachers from that university. So I yeah. mean, me and Chris Applegate still like ping each other on Facebook. So, <laughs> um, yes. Well, as I mentioned before too, you know, my mom taught me how to sew when I was young. And so I learned like some home sewing skills and some DIY skills. But yes, when I was in school, I definitely, definitely learned how to sew. I had to take sewing every semester of college that I was in um, from sewing based on their direction to asking me to recreate my own designs. But I think it's so important because like, like we said about before, just knowing like the limitations of something. And if you want to innovate or improve on something, like it's so easy to be critical when you don't know how something is made. So be looking at a dress or something and like, oh, well, it would have looked so much nicer if that neckline would have been clean finished. Like, well, maybe they couldn't do it. Maybe it just literally was part of the execution in the order of operations that that had to be finished last. And so it had to be bound or turned back or whatever. Um, so if you find yourself making those assumptions or questions or criticisms, like try it yourself, like take it home, take it apart, try to make it the way you would want to, or if it's an expensive garment, just try and remake it yourself. And I think not only knowing like the, the finishes and the machinery that you need to use, but also the order in which things can happen. Um, that was especially a crash course for me in doing swimwear when the trend was that a lot of things were reversible is that once you've sewn a circle, you cannot turn it inside out again after that. So if you want your legs clean finished, you usually can't have the waist or vice versa, or you're going to get like a little seam at the bottom where you had to close the crotch up after. So <laughs> knowing these things, otherwise you ask your factory to do it and they're going to go crazy trying to do it. And they're either going to give you something that's not what you asked for, or they're going to give you what you asked for, but it's probably not feasible for production. And they're not going to tell you until you actually place the order to get it made. And then it's going to screw a lot of things up. Um, or it's going to require like some sort of ad hoc hand sewing or corner cut to try and achieve that. So definitely a responsibility to know what can and can't be constructed when you're asking someone else to make something. Yeah. I don't like uh, to teach too much hand sewing techniques because it's not, 
mass reproducible. And I think a lot of people are so obsessed with couture techniques that they forget that 99% of the world is run on mass produced clothing. That doesn't necessarily mean fast fashion, just anything that's been done on a, like a mass scale, even a hundred pieces, you can't have people like hand stitching a hundred things. Oh, that I mean, reminds you're gonna I mean, pay a lot of money. Yeah, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna pay a lot of money, but yeah, like, but nobody's really wanting to pay that. Yeah. Oh, you know, I was doing this research on Claire McCardle because uh, people were asking me to do a Claire McCardle deep dive video, like in the future. So I was reading up on her, and she used to. So she went to Parsons. I don't know how much mm-hmm. you know about her, but she went to Parsons, and she did a Parsons Paris year. And when she was there, she would attend the. Madeline Vianney sample sale and buy couture gowns for like $10, which with inflation is not $10, but you know, for $10. And she used to take them apart to learn how to make them and then put them back together again and then make her own. Can you imagine, like, do you even need Parsons after that? No, you just needed the student visa to get your butt to Paris so you could buy Vianney samples and learn from her actual dresses. Like, that is insane. I would love to do that. That'd be I such mean, an awesome and she did that with a couple other designers, but VNA was her hero. So mm-hmm. that was that was incredible. But yeah, I think that a lot of uh, people who are getting started and want to be designers, they pick the thing that they don't want to learn how to do, and they keep asking people in the industry if they know how to do it, just to guess whether or not they also have to learn it. I think that's why people keep asking me if I know how to sew. And every time I have one of these Q and A's, they ask designers, do you know how to sew? I'm like, yes, every single designer I've interviewed knows how to sew. Like, all right. So Melissa knows how to sew, has been sewing since she was a kid. Not me. I, I learned later, but like in school mostly, but yeah, the sewing teachers, they told me about this, uh, project that they did. I don't know if it was for every single class, but the, you guys did one where you had to pick a jacket off a designer's runway and try to replicate it just from photos. It's like you had to figure out the pattern and make the pattern yourself and sew it up based just solely on runway photos. Did you do that? I did. It wasn't a jacket. It was just any look that we wanted to oh, replicate. Okay. Um, it's really cool. I liked it a lot. I thought I did a really excellent job of it. Other people absolutely hated it and like wanted nothing to do with that assignment. But what I thought you were going to talk about was um, I had heard that prior to my class, they had tried a project where designers would have to swap sketches and they'd each have to execute each other's sketches, but it caused so many rifts between the students that they had to stop doing it. I did not hear about that, but I can imagine how like friendships would just like tank completely. But that's the kind of thing I'm talking about when people say things like, I'm just going to give a picture to someone to copy or, you know, I'm just going to give somebody a loose sketch and they'll have to figure it out. And my whole thing is like, yes, you can do that. And there are a lot of really talented, experienced pattern makers who can do that, but it will take less time to actually put together an accurate flat with like some notes and details it doesn't have to be a 30 page tech pack, but just like proper information than giving someone a runway photo because pattern makers charge so much money per hour. <laughs> and, and so it would be so much easier to hire a tech designer to do that and work with them on that than just they, people constantly think it's so easy to just hand over a picture. But I've heard a lot that that assignment I just talked about was so challenging because there's so many things that you can't get from just a simple photo. So, yeah. but I, yeah, really, no, I always no. thought that assignment was like, wow, that's a, cause I didn't do that at my school. And I always thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, it was definitely interesting. Um, but yeah. And then when you're working with larger manufacturers and stuff too, like they're going to go back to what they know. They're not going to try and like push the envelope for you if you haven't given them any direction to do so or like understand what it is that they're looking for. So like I'll work with intimate brands and stuff sometimes and be like, well, I sent them this sketch and it came back just looking like a pair of like regular Calvin Klein underwear. It's like, they probably manufacture for Calvin Klein and they're just doing what they know <laughs> because you didn't tell them to do otherwise. Like if you don't give direction, they'll take the path of least resistance and the thing that they 
feel the most comfortable with and do best. So if you want something specific, you have to give specific instructions. Yeah. It's a very well-sewn pair of a silhouette that I did not want. <laughs> yes. This is beautiful. and looks nothing like what I was asking for. <laughs> Okay, so looking back at your schooling and career thus far, is there anything you wish you had done differently? And if so, what is it? I don't think there's really anything that I would have done differently because every you know success or mistake that I've done has led me up to this point. And I'm so grateful for the brands and people that I've had the opportunity to work with. So, you know, it is what it is and I'm happy with where I'm at, but I think there were lessons to be learned for sure and things that I've kind of taken with me to apply towards the future or to just grow from in general. And the biggest one for me is just to trust your instinct, like whether it's about the people that you're working with or, you know, motives or, you know, just or trusting your experience that like you've never been able to properly execute this in the past. Like this is going to be a lot of back and forth, like being able to be confident and speak up when you just know something's not right or something isn't sitting right. But at the same time, keeping an open mind that every new place that you work for, there's a new team, a new manufacturer likely, and a new set of personalities that you have to get along with and work with. And they may have other insights that you don't have. So I think, yeah, it's just uh, I've learned a lot about the difference between uh, balancing my instinct and uh, balancing my open mindedness for sure. Cool. All right. So last question. Do you have any desire to start your own line? get asked this question a lot. Um, and right now my answer to that is no. And it's for a number of reasons. Um, one being that I have worked with so many people that are starting their own lines and I see how much work it is. And to me, that balance between like having full creative control versus getting to clock out and end your day at six and go home hasn't really shifted that much for me. And I think one day in the future, there's a possibility that it will, but I don't want creative control enough to give up my personal life to achieve it is the short version of that. Um, also having your own line, you're not just designing product. You are the CEO, you are marketing, you are, you're doing everything. And I don't want to be that disconnected from the design process. I can't wear that many hats. I've worn a lot of hats, but I can't wear that many hats. And, you know, I, I know my own limitations on things like that. So, um, it's not something that I would see myself doing. Um, long-term, I think I would be more interested in being a consultant or educator. In my experience, people who have worked in the industry for a while, and the more they know about what running a, a garment business entails, the more cautious they are about wanting to start their own company. And if they do, they start thinking about the people they're going to hire. You know, they start thinking about who they can put in place from the get. Yeah. Because they have a much deeper understanding of what it goes into just the day to day. And when I started my line, I did not know enough. And that's why ultimately it was not right for me because I was doing too many things that I didn't enjoy doing. There's so much conversation these days about the, I think the kind of the mystique of entrepreneurship and how that image is being chipped away at because more and more people are coming forth with like, no, it's lonesome and it's hard and like, it's, it's not what it's cracked up to be. So, you know, people, anyway, I got off on a tangent, but I feel the same way. <laughs> yeah. This question I get asked very, very frequently. Also, if I'm ever going to be on Project Runway, no. Oh and <laughs> also, if life is like the Devil Wears Prada, which is also, no. So just oh, my that. God. Do you, know, do you know? Okay. So when I was teaching, okay, so you had already gone at that point in time. But my students, they used to make jokes by not getting in the elevator with me. Like, not because they were genuinely afraid of me, but they're like, oh, you need the elevator? Okay, bye. We're going to wait for the next one. And they were like, they would play that joke all the time. And the way I walk, apparently, they used to call it my do not disturb walk. Uh -huh. <laughs> Don't talk to me in the hallway walk. 
the, I feel like I need that do not disturb walk for the streets of New York City. That would be fantastic. Can you do a demo on that next time, please? So it's fine. Well, you know, I had office hours. So, you know, if they had a question, they didn't come see me during lab. It's fine. Have you seen that show Next in Fashion? I have, yes. Okay, so I was going to watch it, and then my friend sent me the spoiler. Like, he told me, do you remember my friend Kenny? Yes. <laughs> Kenny sent me an Instagram post. He sent me the profile of the winner. And he was like, this person won Next in Fashion, and they're awesome, and I think you would totally get their aesthetic, and you should watch the show. I'm like, well, you just spoiled the ending. Well, I never will. Thank okay, you. So thank you very much. Terrible, terrible friend. What do you like better, Project Runway or Next in Fashion? Next in Fashion, for Why? sure. Do you think it's a more realistic interpretation of the design process? Yeah, it's a lot more, I don't want to say cutthroat because, like, Project Runway definitely was, but in just a completely different way. Like, they work in partnerships a lot from the beginning, and it's like, if you were pulling the weight of your team and the other person wasn't like, it doesn't matter. You're still cut. Like that's very, very realistic. You can't be like, um, excuse me. I actually was like doing my job. Like they're gonna be like, no, like we're not like go away. Both of you, you don't get like immunity if you weren't able to work with a teammate. That's kind of just how that goes. So that part of it, I felt was really real. Also like the experience of pattern making and sewing, they depict a lot better. They have like real equipment and they focus on it a lot more and talking about fit um, they also have like household na- name designers, like specific for each challenge, which was really cool. So like they brought in Christopher Kane, they had Philip Lim, like, but like designing for collections that were more relevant to those major designers. So that was really cool to get like feedback from them. And then they make them do a ton of different categories. So they had an intimates one, they had like streetwear, um, active wear, all kinds of stuff. So it was really cool to watch them kind of try and flex and like the way that they panic is so realistic. It's just basically like unintelligible, like grunting and screaming in the background. Like I was on the planes, I was watching it with subtitles and it was just like unintelligible grunt, like as the subtitle mm. was like, yep. mm. yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's what happens. Yeah. And I think like the moments of like self-doubt and self-reflection just seem a lot more like authentic and, and they're all, I guess I probably should have started with this because this is a really big reason why I watched it. All of these people are already in the industry. They're not like hopefuls, wannabes, like home sewers. Like they all have jobs. Like some of them have like dressed Beyonce and like Lady Gaga and launched streetwear collections. And like some of them have their own brands Some of them work for major brands. So it was a lot more exciting for me <laughs> to be like, that's probably what I would do if I was on there. Like, yeah, I think the right choice and just like actually feeling a connection with the people that were on there and understanding their train of thought instead of just like, I don't know, I guess I'll just sew her into it. Like can't figure out how to put in a zipper. Oh, well. Um, so with the winner, not that you so much necessarily think their aesthetic is the best, but did you think that the, the winner deserved the win? I think so. When it came down to the final two, I think that, I'll avoid using any sort of gender pronouns as to not spoil, but yeah, um, thanks, yeah, Kenny. I think the, the, <laughs> the person who won uh, definitely deserved it. And I think they just took it to the next level a bit more and pushed themselves further. And they're also someone that had kind of struggled throughout the season too, to like really shine, especially in their partnership. So when it came time for them to like blossom into their own, you really saw like an evolution. Cool. All right. I think that's it. Is there anything else that you would like to tell my YouTube audience? I have no idea. (laughs) No last, last random piece of advice. No special thing about you. I don't know. I feel like I've given all my random advice already. I don't know. We've been on this call for a long time. (laughs) Yeah. I've, I've like sucked you dry. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us in this interview. I hope you found it helpful. You know, watch a couple times because Melissa drops so much good information, especially for those of you trying to start out, trying to make some decisions on whether or not to go to school, how to get internships and stuff. And uh, yeah, I think that she can help so many of you. So go ahead and share this video with anyone who is trying to figure out how to start their career in fashion and, you know, kind of where to take things and, uh, yeah.
uh, share, subscribe, like the video if you learned something new today, and I will see you in the next video.